kingdom of Aksum was one of the greatest civilizations of Africa. It lasted for almost 1,000 years throughout the first millennium. It grew rich and powerful through its control of the Red Sea trade. The kings of Aksum embraced Christianity as their official religion and had their own written language and coins. But just as empires rise, so inevitably they must decline. In this program, we look at what brought about the fall of the kingdom of Aksum and the kings and emirs who followed in their wake. modern city of Aksum in northern Ethiopia. At the beginning of the 7th century, it was the heart of a Christian kingdom that was also a major trading power. Aksum covered a large area of territory on the east coast of Africa. But crucially, it also controlled the southern Arabian Peninsula. This gave it dominance over the trade routes to the whole of Arabia, India, China and Europe and markets for its gold, frankincense and ivory. Through its port at Adulis on the Red Sea in modern-day Eritrea, Aksum enjoyed a strategic position that made it a gateway not only for the import and export of goods, but also ideas, culture and beliefs. And from across the Red Sea in the 7th century, there came a major influence which would have a profound impact on Africa and the world. In the province of Hijaz, in modern-day Saudi Arabia, in a town called Mecca, a religion emerged. That religion was Islam, and Muhammad was its prophet. Islam spread relatively easily. Its doctrine was simple to understand. It didn't have a complex hierarchical religious priesthood, so the believer could worship God directly without the intercession of a cleric. At first, Aksum enjoyed good relations with the Muslims of Arabia. In fact, a group of early Muslim converts from Mecca were given sanctuary by the Christian Aksumite king Amr. These Muslims crossed the Red Sea and arrived on what is now the coast of Eritrea. Eritreans lay claim to having the first Muslim shrine in the world dating back to the early 7th century. This is what remains of it. What is certainly true is that around 615 AD, some followers of the Prophet Muhammad fled persecution in Arabia, crossed the Red Sea and arrived here. They sought protection in the court of King Arma, the Aksumite king. He received them favorably and granted them protection. This is supposed to be the exact location where they prayed in what is now the port of Masawa. Muhammad is from the Muslim community in the Eritrean capital Asmara. Islam <laughs> دخلوا مصوع وعملوا فيه مسجد بعدين قابلوا هنا النجاشي النجاشي استقبلهم استقبال كويس ووروها ان الاسلام يشهد ما كان طبعا قبل كده كان هنا دين المسيح وبعد القبائل الوثنيه كان اريتريا هنا في البلد ده خصوصا على ساحل البحر الاحمر 
كل دخل الاسلام بالجزيره العربيه بدون حرب بدون اي حاجه site of some of these early Muslims who arrived in Aksum is still a revered place. The compound of the main mosque in Nagash in northern Ethiopia is believed to be the resting place of 15 of the early followers of the Prophet Muhammad. Some of them returned to Mecca when it was safe for them to do so. Those who remained were buried here, five women and ten men. The compound is a Muslim cemetery that has seen many burials throughout the ages. So Islam has old and strong roots in both Ethiopia and Eritrea. That is because although some Arabs came just as transient traders to Africa, others brought their religion with them and settled. Ahmed Zakaria is the chief curator of the Ethiopian Studies Museum at Addis Ababa University. South Arabia used to export dates, textiles directly from their product or as intermediary from Indian Ocean to this area. Uh, so there, there were uh, precious items for palaces and for the churches. The relationship the, between the Arabs and the Aksumite Empire, we see it extremely smooth relationship because families were going there and some Arab settlers were also coming here. And so we are talking of relation, stronger relationship, blood tie relationship, not only trade. Uh, so the, the Red Sea was not a barrier, one could say. However, the rise and growth of Islam began to challenge the power of the Christian Aksumite kings, and this led to hostilities between them and the Muslims. The Aksumites made a series of attacks on parts of the Arabian Peninsula that they didn't control, like the coastal town of Jeddah across the sea from the Aksumite port of Adulis. Ships used to come to Adulis and attack, and leaders of adults were also going to Jeddah and attack. That was going, going in between them for a long time. The Arabs became strong in late seventh century. Uh, Islam unified them and they start expanding. trade that made the kingdom of Aksum great. And one of the main reasons for its economic decline was that the Arabs seized control of the Red Sea trade route from them. For a kingdom whose wealth had been based on trade, this was a severe blow to its power and prestige. By the 8th century AD, the Aksumite port of Adulis had been destroyed and Aksum would not be able to recover its former standing. Thus, the center of power shifted inland from the coast. But Ahmed Zakaria says religious rivalry wasn't the only factor that led to the decline of Aksum. Aksum decayed because of environmental factor some archaeologists suggesting that the water table moved down and that affects the vegetation of the area because they were depending on ivory slave and um, gold ivory was out of business because of the ecology uh, and there was also another uh, suggestion uh, this has to be proven uh, that there was a disease endemic disease in that area and axum decimated because of that all this meant that the decline of the kingdom was imminent. The history of the kings and patriarchs, or the Kebre Nagast, which glorified Christian rule, describes the violent end of the Aksumite era. If it was the Muslims who'd contributed to putting the Aksumite kings under pressure, it was their old rivals, the Jews, who dealt them the final blow. 
There'd been Jews living in this part of Africa well before Christianity was introduced. Many of these Jews had converted to Christianity, but some had kept their religion. So, towards the end of the first millennium, there were Jews, Christians, and Muslims all living in Aksum. It was a kingdom in which the three major monotheistic religions cohabited, but at times their interests would diverge. Traditional accounts relate that Aksum was destroyed by a queen called Judith or Yodit, and that she was Jewish. She was probably from the Agor people who were Judaic in culture and basic religious beliefs. I'm granted a rare audience with the head of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, His Holiness Abuna Matthias, who tells me more about Queen Judith and the impact she had on the church. She was a warrior a woman, so she destroyed the Ethiopian historic uh, holy books in, in many parts of the country. And they, she was, you know, um, unbelievable. She, she did unbelievable destruction in the country because her belief is Judaism, not Christianity. So she uh, destroyed uh, many, many books. So she is not accepted by the Ethiopian people. Judith, or Yodit, as she was known in Amharic, could have been a figure representing several individuals who may have existed over two to three centuries. Whatever her provenance, she's held to have destroyed all symbols of Christian and imperial Aksumite power. In fact, the Judaic influence from Ethiopia's early history is still evident today. Judaism was in Ethiopia before Christianity, and many of them converted to Christianity, and the others stayed in, the, in their own Judaism religion, I believe, but they were in Aksum and in other places also. But to this day, I understand that Christian Orthodox uh, believers in Ethiopia do have some traditions which are similar to Judaism, for example, the circumcision of boys on the eighth day and also it's forbidden for people to eat pork. And Saturday is also a bit of a holy day as well as Sunday. How many traditions of Judaism do you think have remained in the Christian Orthodox Church here? Well, yes, the um, Saturday was respected by our forefathers uh, because the, according to the Bible, uh, so gradually uh, now we are uh, celebrating Sunday mostly, uh, but uh, it was mixed before, uh, you know, many years ago. Those were respected by the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. So, according to tradition, the story of Aksum began with a woman, the Queen of Sheba, whose son Menelik became the first Aksumite king. And it ended with a woman, the Jewish queen, Judith. Her burial stela lies in a field in Aksum. Ironically, her name and grave are forever connected to the great kingdom she destroyed. The end of the Aksumite dynasty spelt the rise of a new one known as the Zagwe dynasty. This represented a revival of fortune for the Christians. At about 1150 AD, a group of army officers from a place known as Agu seized the throne from the weakened descendants of the Aksumites and replaced them with military leaders. They founded a new capital in the central highlands at Adefa or Lalibela as it's better known and established the Zagwe dynasty. The most famous of the Zagwe kings was Lalibela, who gave his name to the city. His reign began sometime in the 13th century and is thought to have lasted about 40 years. Under him, the people of Lalibela soon prospered and enjoyed a comfortable lifestyle. And the city became established as a place of pilgrimage. It still attracts many visitors who come as pilgrims or tourists today. <laughs> <laughs> it's also refreshing to know that the young people here tell me that they're proud of their history and the founder of their city.
Bella is credited with building a remarkable series of churches hewn out of solid rock. There are 11 of these churches, and they represent an extraordinary achievement of engineering. Just imagine chipping away at the rock to carve out a church this size without the benefit of a mechanical digger. It's likely that King Lalibela would have walked through this very doorway of the church of Beta Medhani Alam, which is the biggest of the churches here at Lalibela and indeed is the largest rock-hewn church in the world. Fikru Waldi Georgis is a local guide born and bred in Lalibela. He's lived and worked here all his life. King Lalibela is the one who behind this marvelous rock in churches. So he was a king and a priest as well, and later canonized by the church as a saint. So he's known as Saint Lalibela. And he carved out this marvelous rock in churches, of course, not only him, with his people and with the help of angels. And the churches are really unique. They are not built up, but cut out of one piece of rock. So it's like statue. Everything is the same material. The wall, the roof, the pillar, all is one piece of rock. And that's really an extraordinary engineering back in the 1200s, using basic materials like hammer, chisel, just simple. No split level, no dynamite, no drilling, just using a chisel and buckets. But there are historians who believe that the complex of churches here at Lalibela could not have been built in the reign of a single king. You believe that the angels helped King Lalibela yes. build these churches? Yes, because the idea was to recreate Jerusalem. Of course, there is a theory also the churches are made in different periods, but the Ethiopian Orthodox Church strongly believes that. That includes me. These are done during the time of Lalibela, within 23 years period, with the help of angels. Lalibela attracts the faithful in their hundreds of thousands every year. So um, this is an interesting duo. Are, are they pilgrims? They are pilgrims, and uh, even he's a pilgrim and a hermit as well. He's a hermit as well. How do you know he's a you hermit? You can tell from his uh, red lock. So this is the natural hairstyle yes, here yes, of, of yes. hermits? Yes, the hermit leaves their hair as it is. Where does he live? Yet no minorus yet. Yeah, for hermits, there's no place to stay. He, he just walks from place to place, from monastery to monastery. So according to the will of God, he goes to a to, uh, place that he, God wants him to be. Is this your first time here at Lalibela? He comes every time. Oh, and he walks. How long does it take him to walk here? Three days. Takes him three days to walk here. So when it's really far, sometimes it could be like two weeks. So the idea that pilgrims and hermits would come here to Lalibela, King Lalibela's idea was to relieve Christians yes. of having to make the long yes. journey to so Jerusalem. So the idea was recreating Jerusalem here in Ethiopia. And there is also belief that pilgrims to Lalibela, they share the same blessing as pilgrims to Jerusalem. So you can imagine how important really it is for those uh, pilgrims. You walk, you walk all the way? He always walks. Sometimes people give him a lift, but he mainly walks with bare feet. With bare feet, no shoes at all. Really? Because he's a hermit. But isn't that uncomfortable, walking on all sorts of terrain? I can go to my bed and I lay my Of course it is. It's, it's not really easy. Very tough skin there. remains of earlier pilgrims to Lalibela who died on arrival. It's considered a blessing to die here. The resting place for these particular worshippers is in the most greatly admired of the churches at Lalibela, St. George's. And when one visits, one can see why. Dug out from deep down underground, it's a marvelous sight and a remarkable feat of construction for that era. St. George's Church is remarkably intact, isn't it? Yes, it is. And it's also the last one to be made. And as you can see, they start from the top, cut down, and then separated all sides. 
again through the dorsal went all the way up or they hollowed it. Look at the corners, how exactly and nicely made the air. So imagine there's no place for a mistake. And look at also the gutter. So the gutter itself mm -hmm. is hewn out of the rock and has got 12 open windows, nine blind windows, and three doors. And the most sophisticated detail of this church is the thickness of the wall. It's thicker at the bottom or it tapers up. So that helps the church to be stable. And, you know, I can just see that even today there are so many people coming to worship still. Yeah, all of the churches are still functioning. Every day, every morning, churches are open for a service. So this is a living heritage, never been abandoned even for a single day and always in use. Can we go inside? Yes, we can. Take our shoes off first. Yes, shoes <laughs> off. Church of St. Mary, which has the best preserved internal decorations, isn't it? Yes, it is. So this one is Beta Mariam, believed to be the first one of all. Even has got a loft. And there is staircase cut out of the rock and spiral to the loft. And highly decorated church with nicely made paintings. There is a fresco, which is painted on the wall. Of course, it's not direct to the rock. They first plastered the wall and then painted it. And there is also an engraving, which is covered. They first covered and painted it. And there is also a canvas, which is painted on a, a cotton, glued to the wall or framed. When King Lalibela died, he was laid to rest just a few metres to my left in one of the rock-hewn churches. The church he was buried in is called Golgotha, named after the spot in Jerusalem where Jesus Christ was crucified. Inside the church, there's a series of life-size relief carvings of the Twelve Apostles and a modern, colourful depiction of King Lalibela himself stands by the curtain behind which his tomb lies hidden from public display. Muslims in this part of Africa. I make my way to the Dahlak Islands on Eritrea's Red Sea coast near the modern day port of Misawa. The Dahlak Islanders were amongst the first to embrace Islam. The largest of the islands is mostly populated by the local Afar people who greet me formally but warmly. More than 200 islands which form the Dahlak archipelago off the Eritrean coast on the Red Sea. Largely arid and flat, fresh water is scarce, so very few of the islands are inhabited. This is the biggest of the islands, Dahlak Kabir, and I've been granted rare access by the Eritrean authorities to come here. The Arab legacy is evident on the Dahlak Islands and indeed some of the inhabitants proudly proclaim their Arab ancestry as this local official confirms. Ahlan wa sahlan, ahlan wa sahlan, shukran jazeelan. Tawin nafsak yani, indik dam arabi, wala bitsuf nafsak yani, bas 
اريتري فقط لا احس مثل ما كان عربي هذا بتصوني بزور لاين القراء وبتتكلم عربي في المنزل وكذا دو يو سبيك عربيك ات هوم؟ بتكلم باللغه الدحلاق اللي هي الدحلاق سو يو سبيك ان ذا لوكال دحلاق لانجويج اند دوز ذات هاف اني عربيك ان ات؟ اللغه الدحلاقيه فيها اي كلمات عربيه؟ فيها كلمات عربيه وفيها كلمات من التقرا وفيها كلمات من انواع كثيره ملخبطه ماخوذه من هنا ومن هنا ازيكم انتم ملخبطين؟ يور لانجويج از ميكس جست از يو ار Abdu Ahmed wants to show me the graves of Muslims who lived and died on the Dahlak Islands. And these ruins, he tells me, are significant. So people, some people believe that these are Muslim tombs dating from the 10th to the 15th century. This one obviously has got some Arabic inscription. It's got Quranic inscriptions, so that would seem to support the theory that these are Muslim tombs from after the time that the Arab Muslims seized control of Dahlak Islands. But evidently, looking at the extent of the cemetery here, there must have been many more people in centuries gone by who lived here. Fulan ibn Fulan, the Mutwafi, the son of Kaza Kada, the Hajara, the Riban, the Alstumumia. So this could be either a, a, a grand tomb of somebody or it could be a small place where people came to pray. Thank you. Shukran Jazeelan. The Dahlak Islands are like stepping stones in the Red Sea, so it's easy to see why the Arabs could cross over and quickly establish Islam on the islands soon after its introduction. The flow of these early groups of Muslims into the highland areas happened gradually. By the 12th century, there were sufficient Muslim communities for a sultanate to be formed, known as the Sultanate of Shoa. Relations between the Zagwe kings and the Muslim communities in the highlands were relatively cordial, though a commercial rivalry soon emerged. Dr. Tekle Haimanot Gebri Selassie is a historian at Addis Ababa University. The Zakia kings, like the other Ethiopian kings, tolerated the Muslims because it was very important for them to get imported items from abroad. And the agents were Muslims because the Muslims could have gone easily to Saudi Arabia and other places which were Islamic states. So for that reason, it was mandatory. They used Muslims as their agents for trade, simply because the Christians could not have easily penetrated into the Muslim area. The Arab traders or the Muslim traders supplied the Zawgish and later on others with different items, mainly finished clothes. But from the 13th century, signs of rivalry between the Christians and Muslims were really beginning to show. Between 13th century to 16th century, we see lots of political ashes between the Muslims and the Christians. Not because of religion, but because of trade control. By 1300, the Sultanate of Shoa was overtaken by a rival Muslim Sultanate called Ifat. The Ifat rulers went deeper into the highlands, and that brought them into more violent clashes with the Christians of Zagwe. Unable to resist the might of the Zagwe dynasty, the Muslim Sultanate of Ifat withdrew east to Harar. But the conflict was not entirely based on religion. Here also we see it's power politics, not religion. Uh, you can utilize religion as mobilizing factors to a certain extent. But not, not the cause. It's not to spread uh, religion. It's to capture power. For me, uh, it's difficult to uh, consider religious wars in the European context. Because they were from 
same culture, same background, and they could move from one to the other easily, from one religion to the other. In Harar, the Muslims founded a new kingdom called Adal in the 1400s, and they began to build their new center and power base here. Visit Harar today, and you immediately get a sense that this is a city with deep historic roots. This is the site of the oldest mosque in Harar. In fact, there are more than 80 mosques within the historic city walls. That is a lot of mosques. Throughout the centuries, the center of power of Islam has shifted, but there is no question that Harar is the most important Muslim city in Ethiopia. The graves of some of the celebrated early Muslims of Harar are still venerated today. This is the tomb of Sheikh Abadir, one of the most respected Muslims in Harar's history. His tomb states he was buried in the 10th century. Amir Redwan is the guide at the site. He came with his 44 companions and made the people as a unified people who were here. So that's the people here stop fighting for racial things. He assembled everybody and uh, he made a great ceremony. He is like the unifier and uh, he is our father in spiritually. So everybody here coming here means being enlightened for everybody. Who visits the tomb of Sheikh Abadir? Uh, Muslims, non-Muslims, and uh, all people from every, I mean, from all. Uh, tribal groups, and Somalis, Hararis, anybody around. We go outside to see some of the burial sites in the compound. Amir, I noticed that some of the graves here have a stone in the middle. What does that mean? So this means uh, uh, female uh, figures uh, are buried in here, like uh, great mystics who used to live in here. So women in Ethiopian Islam are considered to be almost religious authorities? Yes. Here they are even given, I mean, the place of as a saint or wellies. And like other places, we have lots of them. Like even uh, even the mother of Sheikh Abadir, who is buried just right here, is also considered one of the great uh, Sufi even saints. For the next two centuries, the Muslims of Adal, with their stronghold in Harar, and the Christians of the region were in a pretty permanent state of high tensions, if not all-out conflict. In 1270, the Zagwi kings were overthrown by a nobleman, Yakuno Amlak, who'd raised an army against them. He re-established the Solomonic dynasty and laid the foundations for modern Ethiopia. Yakuno Amlak's relations with the Muslims were also strained. Both sides would initiate attacks on the other at various times. Harar was used as a base by its Muslim rulers to launch attacks against Christians. But it also served as a defense against raids by pagan Oromo tribes. This meant that Harar was a prosperous, bustling urban center as it still is today. This is some frankincense which I've picked up in the market at Harar and, you know, it smells wonderfully aromatic. And just as this was critical to Aksumite trade, centuries later, frankincense was a valuable export commodity that helped the Muslim state of Harar prosper. Time to meet some of the locals, I think. So, after the evening call to prayer, I make my way to a traditional home in Harar to meet a couple of the established residents. Hello. 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 Hi. Hello. Hello. I'm Zainab. Hi. Hello. Hello. Thank you. Hi, Fatia. Hello. Hello. Thank you. So this is your house. Yes. Yes. Very beautiful house. Thank you. 
The owner of the house, Juhaira, is joined by a friend who can speak Arabic and so can interpret for me. Busy all day. Yes, always. What's the favor? Hey, Hawira tells me Juhaira works in a government office. She also supplements her income by running her home as a guest house. And guest house. guest house. That guest house. Ah, and you have a guest house. Yes. And that's what you go to. I mean, I'm not going to have a guest house. ما سمحت عنه وبيجوا الناس في مجلة في مجلة بيجوا من فين بيجوا من I'm sure her guests must, like me, appreciate the decorative ornaments all over the house. There's barely a spot on the wall that doesn't have something hanging from it. So Harar is the most famous Muslim city in Ethiopia. Ashhar Medina, Muslim, في الحبش Harar. I ask them both how life is in this famous city, and they tell me they're proud to come from Harar. Well, Muslims في باقي الحبش بيجوا هنا لحرار عشان يشوفوا المدينة وكذا عشان أهم المدينة للمسلمين. They also want to emphasize that in their experience, communal relations are excellent in Harar today between people of different faiths. It's dusk, and I thank my hosts and take my leave, for I want to go and see an enduring, if bizarre, custom that exists in Harar. the extraordinary hyena men of Harar. Every evening, the men and boys whistle to entice hyenas in from the wild, and then they will feed them with their own hands. And um, I have to confess, I am a little bit nervous because I know that some hyenas would just suddenly emerge in the darkness out of nowhere. I'm not quite sure I'm it's a myth that hyenas are just scavengers. They do kill to eat. In fact, they have the strongest jaw of all predators. That's all very reassuring for me, to put it mildly. These young men actually pass the food from their own mouths to that of the hyenas. Brave, foolhardy, or both? This is a tradition that dates back for centuries, and the idea was that they would feed the hyenas to try to um, prevent them from eating their livestock. When I saw the barrier, I saw the barrier, I saw the barrier, and 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 I saw the barrier. Which animal do you feed them? Do you know which ones are which? Can you identify them? Mm. So I make my excuses and leave after declining an offer to feed the hyenas myself. <laughs> come across a wedding in Harar, unfortunately, not a hyena in sight. The bride's modest wedding dress is a reminder that Islam is as much a part of Ethiopia's history as its orthodox Christianity. is one of the five gates of the historic walls of Harar. In the mid-16th century, Harar was established as the heart of Ethiopian Islam. The dynasty of the emirs of Harar was founded and they ruled Harar as a Muslim state for three centuries.
I've come to visit one of the descendants of the hereditary rulers of Haram. Sheikh Maftuh Abu Bakr is the eighth generation of the emirs of Harar, but the grand style he and his family lived in is a thing of the past. They give me a very relaxed welcome. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. Shukran jazeelan, Sheikh Maftuh. Inta aham shakhs min al usra al malika hina fi Harar? Naam, naam. والسكان هنا الناس لسه عندهم احترام كثير للأسرة المالكة فأنا عايز أسألك يعني للآن الناس اللي هنا عايشين في حرر إيه رأيهم عن الأسرة المالكة ولا شيء أي شيء لسه يعني عايشين في عظمة مثلا يعني بيحتبروكم طبعا كعلماء احترام فيه احترام احترام فيه ولا his wife Maburdi Abdella earns money by sewing and weaving ornaments. The Sheikh and Sheikher are a reminder of the long history of Muslim rulers in Harar. Their home is an oasis of peace in what is a busy and lively city. Harar is still the most influential Muslim city in Ethiopia today, and the churches of Lalibela are the country's most famous Christian monuments. Back in the shadows of the historic churches at Lalibela in the central Ethiopian highlands, I enjoyed the traditional song and dance of the people of that area. Music and performance is as vibrant, colorful, and evocative as the history of this region has been throughout the ages. From the pre Aksumite civilizations to the rise and fall of the powerful kingdom of Aksum, from the Christian dynasties to the Muslim sultanates, Ethiopia and Eritrea represent a remarkable period in Africa's history. Oh, 